Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. It's great to be back at GoTo Copenhagen. I was back here la uh, last year. Thoroughly enjoyed my time there talking about uh, microservices at that time. Today, I've got a slightly cryptic title, but I am genuinely excited to see so many of you come along to it. After I actually started putting the presentation together, I thought probably the title isn't kind of truly representative of what I want to talk about. But the subtitle, Lessons Learned in 15 Years of Building Sort of Software, 15 years is roughly my career so far. Uh, hopefully, that, what I'm going to do is share some of my successes and some of my failures, some of my learnings. Hopefully, many more years to go in this career, and there's many more things I can learn from all of you, so please do come up and share your things after the talk or over lunch or over the next few days. But as a kind of heads up on this one, a kind of TLDR, if you like, and a kind of also a confession, this talk is primarily about communication. Primarily about sort of strategy, people skills. So if you're expecting kind of architecture guidance or maybe, you know, how to kind of um, build operations, infrastructure stuff, this isn't that talk. And I won't be offended if you do leave. I've got a bunch of other talks online on the GoTo channel, on some other channels as well on YouTube, where I do talk about the technical side of continuous delivery, the technical side of microservices. But in my work as a consultant, I often find the hardest problems are people problems. And that's what I want to talk about today. I think defining and effectively sharing the vision and the goals of any organization, be it profit or non-profit, is really, really important. And many companies I work with, engineers and part of the engineering team that I join, we have a really hard time building the right thing when we don't know what the vision is, we don't know what the goals are. Using and agreeing on models really helps. Yeah? It reduces friction, and a key thing is it allows us to have a common language. Yeah? Uh, it, many times I go into teams, and even within teams, they're using different words to describe different concepts, let alone development, architecture, and business, even within different teams using different words sometimes. And I think using models gives us that kind of common understanding. Optimizing for feedback and learning is a core core skill as well. And I think continuous delivery is a great catalyst for this, but we're going to touch on some of these things, how we can optimize, how we can kind of um, make sure we put the people side of this kind of into our development processes as well. Now, this is me at, at Daniel Bryant on the interwebs. I've, I've managed to corner most of the interwebs, GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so forth. Uh, I've got a quite varied background. I started as an academic moved into development, did some ops work, did some DBA work. Uh, then I did kind of tech lead, did a CTO gig at a couple of companies, and some success, a bunch of failures, to be honest. But I learned every step along the way. And now I've definitely, I'm doing more um, continuous delivery consulting now. And I'm working with a Boston-based company called DataWire, who are specializing in Kubernetes tooling. So I'm doing a whole bunch of work with Kubernetes and Envoy. But still, a lot of the stuff I do these days is people problems. Even though I'm hardcore into the tech, still program as much as I can, um, I've realized that continuous delivery can be a genuine catalyst to drive change in an organization. And my friend and I, Abraham, we've just finished a book, actually, CD uh, in Java, which I think is available outside. So I'm super looking forward to seeing that one. Um, so let's start with defining and sharing the vision. This is your purpose. As, you know, as, as I'm assuming most of you in the room are engineers or sort of engineering discipline. Um, we, as engineers, need to understand the mission of our company the goals of our company. And I'm going to start with one of my favorite business strategy books, uh, and that's, oh, it skips. that's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Yeah. I, my, my parents read this to me as a kid. Fantastic book. I've constantly reread it. There's so many life lessons in this book, yeah. But one in particular I want to sort of take on today is a fantastic um, section of the book. And I'll literally, I'll read this because it's quite, it's quite a good quote, yeah. It's a, where basically Alice is walking along and she encounters a fork in the road, and there is a Cheshire cat in the tree. Which road do I take? asks Alice. Where do you want to go? says the Cheshire cat. Alice responds, I don't know. The Cheshire cat thinks for a moment, ponders, and says, well, then it doesn't matter which road you take. Yeah. Now that for me is quite a powerful kind of like, you know, maxim for many things in life. I frequently play the role of Cheshire Cat in organizations, yeah. Uh, they come in and they say, oh, I'm not sure if we're going to product A, product B. I'm like, well, what's your goals of your company? Well, we don't really know. It doesn't matter whether you go product A, product B, to be honest. I often get lots of calls. People say, I want to put, um, you know, I maybe put an orchestrator in my frame, in my, um, sorry, in my um, application stack. I'm not sure whether to choose Kubernetes 
or Docker Swarm. I'm like, what's the values of your development team? Well, I don't know. It doesn't matter whether you choose Kubernetes or Docker Swarm then. You've got to understand your kind of high-level goals, what you as a team value. That will then drive a lot of the decisions we make as engineers, let alone the business folk. Yeah? I'm a massive fan of sort of empowering and educating developers with things like business model generation. Uh, I'm a really big fan. If you're a startup and you're looking for product market fit, you're looking to understand your, you know, your um, potential customers, you're working on your value proposition, the, the kind of models in this book are just genuinely fantastic. Fantastic providing a framework to sort of develop kind of the actual products and test hypotheses. But me as an engineer, I can look at what the CEO and the, and the, you know, the high level team have put together, and that really helps me make day-to-day -day decisions as an engineer. I just think of um, Jamie Dobson from Container Solutions. I'm sure a few of you might know of Container Solutions. Uh, I met Jamie several years ago. I went into his office in Amsterdam, and on the wall for everyone to see, visitors included, was the business model canvas, how Container Solutions was running experiments, trying to make money. And within minutes, Jamie ran me through it, and me as an engineer, I knew what Container Solutions was trying to do. I knew what they valued. I knew what they didn't want to do and so forth. And it just helps me so much as an engineer understand the organization. Now, if you're a bit, f oops, if you're a bit further along uh, in your journey, you've got product market fit. You're perhaps working for a bigger enterprise. This is a fantastic book. Scaling Up is basically an operating system for a company. Like Linux or Windows for a company, yeah? And we use it at InfoQ. Uh, the, the company behind InfoQ is called C4 Media, and we are 100% distributed. We're all over the world, literally, different time zones. But InfoQ has been running for many years, does quite well with, with sort of um, the revenue, but more importantly, it's furthering its mission to further the human side of software engineering. Now, the way that Floyd Marinescu has done this, and Floyd's the, the founder, along with Roxanne, and the way they've done this is they, you know, once they got bootstrapped, they moved to scaling up. And they, we all do it now. It's part of everyone, part of it, the InfoQ team, gets together three times a year, and we, we sort of focus on, we've already got our, our core values and our, um, you know, our mission, and our sort of value proposition. We've already got that defined. And I, what I really like here is the, the BHAG, you can see in the middle there. That stands for big hairy, audacious goal. It's your big goal, what the whole mission purpose. Like and I mentioned with, you know, with C4 Media, it's basically forwarding the human side of software engineering. And with that kind of big goal in mind, we then it kind of ri it ricochets down through. We have strategic you know, um, objectives over five years, three years, one year, and then we also dial it back into KPIs and individual plans for progress. And you know, I, I'm not really an engineer, at C4 Media, but we do have development uh, teams building the, the InfoQ sites, and they take part in this. And it's a fantastic way for everyone in the organization to be fully aligned. Even though we all speak many languages, live in many different countries, have many different diverse backgrounds, this allows us to gain alignment, whether we're writing stuff, whether we're coding, or whether we're marketing. And as simple as it may seem, this is massively, massively important, I think. I'll go back. Well, the, the kind of primary goal of those two models, really, is about sharing the vision. It's about increasing empathy. And really, it comes down to this. Wherever I'm working in the organization, can I relate what I'm doing to other people and to the goal? And I've stolen this kind of slide here from a Harvard Business Review. But I've done this kind of um, technique a few times, gone into companies, and often a lot of value I can add as a consultant is just getting relevant people together in the room. Bizarre as that may seem, sometimes like I go into big organizations and we get the C-level in and we get the architects in and we get the engineers in, and they never speak to each other. Yeah? So getting them in the room is super powerful. But if you can focus everyone on mapping down right from the strategic goals how that impacts the architecture and how in turn that impacts me making my development choices, not only is it increased empathy, Sea level understands why what we're doing in the trenches, and we understand what they're doing in the sea level. Not only does it do that, but it, it kind of gives us a steer on making decisions. One example: I, I went into a company, and we did this kind of um, ex, uh, this kind of exercise. And what happened is the company, it was a monolithic code base. They, um, the sea level, said we need to go to multiple countries very common use case, and the dev team didn't quite understand what was going on, so they forked the code base. They said, oh, we know, we know we're targeting one country, so we've got UK over here, got this other country here. They forked the code base because they believed there was different requirements coming down, 
and they believed it was only going to be two countries. And we actually got chatting. It's like, no, no, we're going to be supporting global markets. Yeah, there's the UK market, the English market, but we want to support multiple markets. Knowing that, the decision to fork the code base was very bad. Yeah? We should have really put much more energy into actually making the one code base reusable over the time. And I've, they're not alone. This one company I'm picking on, I've actually had a couple of other companies do exactly the same. Forked code bases, particularly in monoliths, with the thought being they can kind of pass different things off and you know, evolve at different speeds. But ultimately, the, the business goals indicated they shouldn't have done that in most cases. So having this gives you a shared kind of language to, as an engineer to push back, to ask questions, to empathize with what's going on. Now, we see many companies doing this on a grander scale. Yeah, Amazon are famous for talking about customer obsession. That's their kind of primary goal. Netflix have got fantastic resources online. They really value freedom and responsibility in all their business goals. Yeah. The freedom and the responsibility is really key. Uh, Yelp have got some fantastic guidelines in the architecture space on how to build services, microservices. They've got like a, this, if you can freely look at it, it's on GitHub. There's a kind of checklist with should you create a new service? Should the functionality go into other services? Um, or should you kind of just add it as a method on, you know, on some stuff? It's, it's really, they've clearly really thought from their business goals, mapped it back into architecture goals. And they've documented it for not only their team, but the world to see, which I think is fantastic. I did some work with Halfa last year uh, over in Germany, and they've done similar kind of things with their API guide. They've really put the purpose of why are you writing an API when you're writing an API? Think about these things. This is how an API, an API is basically a shop front. It's a marketplace for our business. The way you design the API should be as important as designing a shop front. It's our kind of view on the world. And by knowing that stuff, me, as an engineer, I can make much more educated decisions. I know where to put the most of my time. I know where to, you know, upfront think about design and, and things like that. Same with sharing the actual user journey. Now, I'm a big fan of event storming. I think there's a few sessions on the conference talking about event storming. I totally recommend um, learning more about it. But it gels nicely with user story mapping. Now, Jeff Patton and the team, if you haven't bumped into this, totally worth a read. It's only a smallish book. Um, but it's a really nice way of visualizing your product backlog. Event storming gives you the tools to kind of understand what the business is doing. You map from your goals to user journeys. But I re as much as I like tools like Jira, I often find them really hard to visualize what are we doing overall as an organization. And event storming, you kind of have your core, you know, your epics, your core kind of user journeys at the top, the backbone, and then you map it down to releases. You have sort of, you know, that user tasks and so forth. One example I borrowed from them. Um, I think it's Stephen uh, Palenci, uh, um, Rodalski, sorry, Stephen Rodalski's blog, fantastic blog there, I've put the link. And it walks through an example. And, and as an engineer, using this kind of technique, I can very easily understand where what I'm doing fits into the bigger picture. Yeah, really, really important, I think. So moving on, I've talked a few times around sort of models. I think models are really, really important. They're kind of, the joke is that all models are wrong, but some are useful, yeah? So the, the kind of models, as in the models are a model of the world, a representation of the world. They're not going to be perfect. But many of us within engineering, we are building models all the time. We have a business problem, we have a domain, and we're building kind of a representation of that business problem in our code. One mistake I made, for example, in the past was um, I introduced an extra model by going mock crazy. If everyone's played with mock, uh, uh, mocks, I had um, easy mock in the Java world, and I basically had my business world, the code we were creating, and a bunch of assumptions I codified into, a, into the mocks. And I had three, three models of the world, which is bad. But um, in general, I'm going to look at models from a slightly higher abstraction uh, here. And I've done a, a, that's a whole bunch of work in the Java space. And anyone who's a Java engineer knows that serialization in Java is not optimal, shall I say. But I have experienced more challenging kind of um, deserialization problems. And the fundamental one is this, yeah. Getting an idea from someone's head into someone else's head is really hard. Yeah, we, you know, we, we talk, we draw, we you know, do various different things, but conveying kind of like one model to another is really, really hard. Yeah, I've really struggled with this over the, over the years. And like I say, most of the problems I get called in as a consultant are actually communication problems. 
Now, I think with the kind of the rise of microservices and so forth, we've really gone back to domain-driven design. Yeah, um, fantastic work by Eric Evans. It's been around for many years, to be honest, but microservices really forced us with a hard network boundary to think about how we're going to model individual bits of our system. You can totally do DDD in a monolith. I've seen companies do that, and it works very well. But it became more uh, sort of obvious, I guess, when microservices popped up. And all domain-driven design is about is about effectively modeling the, the real world, the business problem, in code. It's much easier if you can all use the kind of same model, the same language, then like requirements coming in map very much to the code you've created. Yeah. Va and Vaughan Vernon's kind of con like, this is a fantastic short version of, of his red book earlier on. Fantastic kind of a, it talks more about some of the principles about how to create models using the technology we have. Uh, with us now, things like REST and, and microservices, things like that. But one of the things I really, really like about um, DDD is this notion of a ubiquitous language, a common language. Yeah, I've worked. I've been fortunate enough to work in a couple of companies where we've got DDD going really well. And one thing I noticed was the the, the sort of the artificial boundary between the business and development disappeared. We all spoke the same language. It was genuinely a bit magical, to be honest. It's only happened to me a couple of times in my career. But this kind of ubiquitous language where the business says, you know, this is how I map, this is my thought process, and it maps almost to the entity names we've chosen, to the code we've written, it really reduces friction. Yeah. And I've seen the same kind of thing with a common technical language. Yeah. A lot of times I, as a consultant, get called into an organization, and I ask people to draw their architecture. And, I ask, and I, if I can, I ask, like, say I've got like 10 people in the room, I say, draw your system architecture, but don't share your drawing with anyone. I want you to draw it individually. And usually, like, with 10 people in the room, I, on average, get about 12 different architectures. Yeah? Everyone draw, draws different kind of architectures. And I, you know, I, I get it, I've been there. I've totally done a bunch of crazy architectures, and I've totally had a hard time describing the architectures I've done as well. But since I, I bumped into Simon Brown a few years ago, um, and he's got this C4 model. Fantastic model. And basically, it's got um, context, uh, containers, components, and classes. Now, we don't use the classes stuff much, but the, the context, the container, and the components, and the kind of machinery he's created, the model, modeling tools he's created as part of this, are really valuable for having sensible discussions. Yeah. Now, when we have arguments, I often notice some people are arguing, say, they think they're at the container sort of level. And when I say container, it's not Docker. It's, like, it's, a, it's more abstract concepts, uh, concept than that. But they think they're arguing something at the container level, and actually they're at the component level. Yeah? And having a common language allows us to go, oh, stop. I think what you're saying there is actually a component choice. And then you can discuss around these things. Using models gives you a common language to have those kind of safe conversations. They give you almost a vocabulary to go, you know, oh, I'm not sure you're, what you're saying there's right, or, or I think what you're talking about there will actually impact the whole system. Yeah, we need to go up a level, these kind of things. These kind of models are really useful. Same with sort of creating a problem definition language. Now, are people familiar with the Kinevin model at all? Has anyone bumped into the Kinevin model? Yeah, a few people, I see a few hands. Awesome. If you haven't, it's well worth re reading about. Uh, it's a sense-making model. It's a model for understanding how we make sense of the world. And you know, in the programming kind of space, you can see it kind of goes almost from the bottom up around there. Obvious kind of um, problems are, if you ever had one of those um, Lego kits or the turtles that draw, and you kind of, like, you pro as a kid, you programmed them, and you said, two steps forward, turn left or turn right, two steps forward, you know, really simple programmatic instructions. That's kind of the obvious space. There's cause, there's effect. Complicated is sort of up one more level. It's, you know, you can still reason about the problem, but it requires expertise. Now, in our space, as in like building a CRUD solution on an entity, it's pretty complicated, yeah? You've got to put some machinery in to kind of maybe like you're doing some Spring Boot with a REST interface, but CRUD is a well-understood thing. You know, create, retrieve, update, delete. Most of us operate in the complex domains. Yeah? Now, in the, the jump between complicated problem spaces and complex is massive. Yeah? The, you can only reason about the effect after, sorry, you can only re, re, um, reason about the cause of an effect after the fact. Yeah? In complex domains, what works one day doesn't work the next day. 
So you've got to do like, continual kind of experiments. You've got to be monitoring that kind of domain. It's a very different tool set required for complex domains. And I see many engineers getting confused whether they're working in complex or complicated domains. Yeah? And you really need to sort of choose appropriately. There's a fantastic blog post actually by Liz Kyo. I get a lot of my sort of um, Kinevin kind of thinking from Liz. She's got some fantastic um, YouTube bids. She's Lunivore on Twitter, I think. And she's really helped me understand that, again, giving me more sort of tools to go, when we're struggling with a problem, I say, ah, I think you're treating this as a complicated problem. And actually, it's a complex problem. We need to approach this problem in a different mindset. And kind of related to this, fantastic. You know, whether you like Amazon as a brand or not, uh, Jeff Bezos is a very interesting character. And some of the things he, you know, he, he says and does, I, I do sort of pay attention to, and I really sort of learn some stuff from him. So fantastic. It's, it's a letter to shareholders. He, he produces it once a year. Even if you're not into your stocks and shares, I totally recommend once a year reading Jeff's um, letter to his shareholders. And one thing I really liked, it was, a, it was yeah, last year, where he talked about sort of in terms of making decisions at a business. Some decisions are consequential and irreversible or nearly irreversible. One-way doors. And these decisions must be made met I this, met methodically, carefully, and with great deliberation and consultation. These are what they call type one decisions in Amazon. Yeah? Really important, irreversible or nearly irreversible decisions. He talks about, on the flip side, many decisions, maybe even most decisions in the business and tech, aren't like that. They're changeable, reversible, they're two-way doors. If you've made a suboptimal type two decision, you don't have to live with the consequences for that long. And type two decisions can and should be made by high judgment individuals and small groups. Yeah. And the fact you're at this conference, you're pretty much a high, you know, um, a high judgment individual. You're continually learning. You're continually thinking about these things. So what it's basically saying is free up your teams to make these decisions, yeah, the, the type two decisions. The hardest job probably is figuring out what's a type one decision versus what's a type two decision. And only you can really figure that out because your context is different than mine, for example. But one thing, I, I, I see the Netflix team talking about this a lot. And they've got a couple of great videos. This was actually Shubham, um, uh, sorry, Sudham, recently at QCon San Francisco, did a fantastic um, talk around how they built an evolutionary architecture within the Play API of Netflix. You know, when you press Play on Netflix, the whole bunch of stuff goes on in the background, DRM, streaming, all this kind of stuff. Um, and they talked about the three type one decisions that they came to with this problem was appropriate coupling, communication style, synchronous, asynchronous, and data, ar sorry, data architecture. And in particular, whether to go eventing or whether to go kind of relational, uh, optimizing for query models, things like that. And in my, this is massively broad, my general experience is these are often the type one decisions you encounter. Tabs versus spaces is a type two decision at best. Yeah? But I've seen some companies have massive arguments about tabs versus spaces and other quite trivial things. It used to be the case that programming languages was a type one decision. You know, when I started my career in Java monoliths, like you went Java, you went .NET, or you kind of went Ruby. Now, with microservices, you, you can kind of mix and match. I almost say there are, that choosing a programming language is a type 1.5 decision, in that you can mix and match, but you've got to realize there's different tool chains, there's different um, mindsets, and there's different skills required for different languages. So I'm, although I like the polyglot idea, I would say be careful bringing in more than a couple languages to a microservice stack. So on this kind of note now, moving on a little bit to evaluation. And some of the problems that I've totally done, and some of the problems I see now in terms of evaluation, if I'm choosing a technology, choosing things, um, one is the anti-pattern, I, I like to call it, is driving a tank to the shops. Yeah. So if I'm sat on my couch back home in the UK, and I realize we're out of milk, yeah, if I'm going to go to the shops and get milk, I should probably walk to the shops. Yeah. Maybe cycle. I like cycling, to be honest. Maybe cycle to the shops. I should not get in a tank and drive a tank to the shops. It is total overkill. Yeah. But in that analogy, if I'm, say, building a one-page website to advertise my business, that's kind of going for milk in my case, should I use Kubernetes to deploy that? I don't know. Don't I love Kubernetes. Yeah. You know, many, it's an amazing framework. It's seriously amazing. But single-page web app, Kubernetes, probably like driving a tank to the shops. Yeah. Probably a bit overpowered. 
The other thing I see is the kind of not invented here thing, yeah? Or oh, I'm a big fan of XKCD. Or that I want to make it generic. People don't even go to the market and see what's there. They think, oh, no, I can definitely build that better. And I've totally done this, yeah? I've totally done this. So I'm a bit of a hypocrite, really, but I've hopefully learned my lesson on these kind of things. What I do now with um, teams that I run is whenever someone gets, you know, super excited, and I always, you know, admire the, that kind of passion of people, the excitement, but often they get a bit uh, single, single track. And what I now suggest is whenever you come up with a sort of big-ish kind of problem, you need to frame the problem very clearly and the general solution. Yeah. But also offer two alternatives. Now, this is not a kind of what should I name my method kind of you know, thing. It's more of a type one type decision. But if you're thinking, should we bring event sourcing in? You know, event sourcing is uber powerful, but it requires a different mindset. Yeah. Now, maybe we don't need event sourcing. Maybe we just need you know, eventing or messaging. Maybe we just need RPC. Who knows? But state the problem, state the general solution, offer alternatives. By offering alternatives, it forces you to open your mind, kind of empathize with the problem. I also recommend to people I sort of I work with is state your recommendation, because everyone always has a recommendation. Kafka, Docker, Kubernetes, these kind of things. But you must include the benefits and the drawbacks. And I've done this, and too often in the past, I've been so positive about a new technology, so positive about a new um, sort of approach, that I don't really communicate the trade-offs to my team. Yeah? And I work, in my job as an architect now, a lot of what I do is about making sure we all understand the trade-offs and how that relates to our business goals and, and vision and values. It, again, I'll use this word many times in the presentation, but it's, a lot of it is about empathy. Understanding from other people's perspectives, you know, your fellow teammates, your, your, your business, and so forth. And particularly, I've, I've had a quite a bit of trouble. I'm, I'm, I probably most identify as a developer, but I've done a whole bunch of ops stuff recently. And it's really interesting on the teams I'm working with now, like most of them are ops teams because we're doing Kubernetes and Envoy and stuff. And we have some fascinating conversations where I can bring the dev perspective into what they're doing. Yeah, and they can teach me about ops. So it's, it's a win win kind of thing. But this cultivating empathy is really important. A couple of models that I like. One is the spine model. Yeah, so the spine model. I, I, I bumped into it a couple of years ago. I've used it in a few sort of different um, consulting gigs. Its primary pitch is that effective conversations make for effective collaboration. And often we as human species, we've done so well with tools. That's why we are so successful as a species. But we do get stuck in a dilemma where equally plausible options are available. Yeah, and the classic tool thing I bump into is Java versus Ruby. That kind of thing, yeah. But if you go up the, the, the spine, you can break the deadlock. Yeah, and, and, the, and the website goes into more detail about how to do this. But a lot of companies I walk into where they are having this Ruby versus Java debate, it becomes almost religious. Yeah, and I've done both, so I kind of get both sides. You know. But you need to kind of break some of that kind of um, that, 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 uh, equally plausible options. You need to go up the stack and say, well, what do we value? In this particular service, practices that we might be looking at is heavy refactoring. Therefore, Java, with its strong type safety, might be more appropriate. Or are we going to be prototyping a lot and doing BDD? Well, therefore, Ruby might be more appropriate. But by going up the spine, you, and ultimately you get to the real needs of the business or the team, you can often break these deadlocks where it is you're stuck on you know, Docker, Kubernetes, Java, Ruby, whatever. I've put some notes there, and you can pop along and, and check them out later on. But it's a really interesting model that I found for, again, sort of realizing when we get stuck what model we're kind of using and going up the spine until we actually have the right conversation. Often, as humans, we get stuck you know, with our opinions, and I'm, I'm totally the same. Um, but we need to pause, step back, and then realize what are we actually talking about here? What are we actually arguing? A couple of techniques for making uh, type 1 tooling decisions. One is the classic, uh, I borrowed this one from Matt Rabel. If you're really investing in something that you know is going to be you know, massively influential to your business, you might want to spend a bit of time kind of coming up with some criteria and matching it to your options available. And you want to do this for a bunch of people, like, and then compare results. It, it sort of removes some of the subjectivity. Uh, so I definitely recommend this kind of thing. Uh, fantastic book by um, Neil Ford, Rebecca Parsons, and Pat Kuar. And they use fitness functions, which is arguably a lighter weight version of, of the table I just showed you. But these are great for ensuring you're having the right conversations. We've identified what we value. And then we go through and say, how does this tool map to these values? It allows us to have excuse me, the right conversations, which is really key. 
couple of massively generalized recommendations from my anecdotal experience. Yeah, there's always classic ones. Um, you know, my context is not the same, same as yours, but there's a few things I do see as a consultant, some patterns. The first is always assume good intentions. If you don't know, I w constantly walk into um, projects and I'm like, my God, how did this get this bad? You know, <laughs> kind of crazy code, crazy frameworks here. But you always assume good intentions because I've been that person. You know, when I first started my career, I spent loads of time creating ORM frameworks and stuff and did all crazy things like that. We've all got our individual styles. Yeah, you got to, you know, I think also people put too much into politics sometimes as well, thinking everyone's got bad intentions. But the flip side of, of that sort of slide is Hanlon's razor. Yeah, and Hanlon's razor says, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Yeah, and, and I'm going to say I've been there. I'm not saying the person is stupid, but the action is stupid. Yeah, and I have totally been there sometimes. So rather than sort of judge the person, it's all about educating, having the right conversations. And there's some fantastic advice actually by this blog, I think it's Matthew, Matthew Cook, a fantastic blog that talks a lot about um, how often people, we just, we don't know that much and we're making decisions based on what we know. We're not trying to be evil, but it kind of look like that sometimes, yeah? So th these are kind of two things I find really, really interesting. On that note, uh, you know, this is a kind of a random one from the sort of talk, but I totally recommend choosing boring technology. Yeah, I do genuinely love Java. I think Java's really good. I use Go and I use JavaScript and other things as well. But and MySQL, MySQL is a fantastic kit, bit of kit. Yeah, uh, too many times I see people ch chucking in Kafka, chucking in all these kind of crazy NoSQL things. And again, they're am they're all amazing tools, and they've all got a use case. But if you're dealing with heavily structured data, probably a relational database like MySQL is fantastic. Yeah. So Dan's got a whole interesting. You know, he was actually uh, one of the foundational people at Etsy over in the, over in the US. And he's got a whole kind of thesis on why you should uh, sort of spend your innovation tokens, as he calls it. If you're spinning up a new project, give yourself innovation tokens, which basically ration how much cool new stuff you can bring into a project. Yeah. So definitely recommend checking out those things. Uh, coming on to, to continuous delivery now, sort of coming into the, the final bits of the, of the talk. When I started my career, it was very much in terms of, you know, manual assembly, uh, doing Java, kind of compiling things, and then, you know, we did sort of bring in Jenkins towards the end of that, that's my first sort of big project, actually, but we were doing a whole lot of kind of manual assembly of things, yeah. And the analogy now has kind of changed in that we, it's all automated these days. You can codify a lot of best practices into a build pipeline. Yeah. I'm talking everything from um, like uh, running unit tests, running component tests, and so forth, but definitely things like security testing. Really recommend, if anyone's not bumped into OWASP, but I think there's an OWASP talk here, actually, which I'll, I'll be attending for sure, but OWASP has got some fantastic guidelines for how to build in security into your applications. And there's tools at all stage of the pipeline these days that you can use to assert those properties in the pipeline. You have your decision, you have your discussions, you make your decisions, but then you can codify. Uh, there's a uh, BDD security. It's a fantastic framework that plugs into the ZAP penetration testing tool. And you can basically define using kind of given when then syntax a bunch of security rules that then you can run automatically using this ZAP tool. And it will spin up, you can say, spin up your instance of your app, check for um, cause policy, check for cookie um, you know, manipulation, check for SQL injection. There's a whole bunch of things these days we can codify in our pipeline. You always got to remember with continuous delivery, though, that the key thing is, is basically velocity and stability is key to business success. That's the key thing. And a friend of mine in London, Steve Smith, says that continuous delivery is achieved when stability and speed can satisfy business demand. Discontinuous delivery occurs when it doesn't. Yeah. And I'm sure many of you can recognize this kind of thing, but I have seen some like teams with really simple CID, CD solutions, but because they understand it, like, what the business wanted, they understand the speed the business wanted to go at, they understand the implications of you know, making a stable, robust, and secure product, they made the correct decisions. Yeah, more often than not, as a consultant, when I go into some, uh, a company and I say, um, you know, what's the scale that's going to be operating at? Oh, web scale. Yeah. I say, well, should this be secure? Yes, 
is the answer, yeah? And that's like the kind of obvious answers to the questions, aren't they? But you, if you really sort of share, like I've talked about at the start, your business goals and where you make money and where the risks are, it really drives decisions we as technologists can make, which massively impact. Security being a really you know, key one. Many times I go into organizations and it's only a passing thought to security. Well, I can teach you a few techniques. There's a few techniques online where you can very easily put these things into your pipeline. And once you've codified them in your pipeline, you can then run them automatically. It moves from that manual assembly line to this kind of you know, robot-driven assembly line. You're constantly verifying. And, and it's one of those things that you incrementally build up, and then velocity gets faster and faster and faster. So do think, understand your business goals, understand the risks, implement continuous delivery where appropriate. Now, I'm not expecting people to read this, but this is a kind of classic pipeline in the Java world where I'm coding, say, on my local machine on the left. I commit to, say, GitHub. I build using a build server like Travis or um, J uh, Jenkins. And I do some testing. And as we go along here, the environments get more realistic from QA to staging to prod. Many people I work with are quite down with the concept of continuous delivery quite down with the pipelines. And as we bring in, say, microservices, we might have more pipelines, we might have contracts to assert services work well together, or we might even funnel all the services into a single kind of um, staging environment before releasing. But most of us get this concept of continuous delivery. The bit where I see kind of sort of struggle sometimes is this optimizing for learning, optimizing for feedback. This is really a really key part of continuous delivery. You've got this amazing pipeline, but you've got to continually feed back in to make it better. Yeah? From a business perspective, are we proving our hypotheses? But also from an architecture perspective, there's a bunch of awesome tools you can use to assert architectural properties. And things like performance and scalability, really important to continually feed this back in. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about dashboards. I think dashboards are super, super powerful. But one sort of anti-pattern I've seen a little bit, and Ben Siegelman, like, and, and this is actually Bridget Cromhout's uh, tweet, but Ben Siegelman talked about this last year of Velocity, is a lot of people start developing these kind of nuclear reactor style dashboards. Now, don't get me wrong, if you're running a nuclear power plant, a nuclear dashboard is a good idea, yeah? And you will get trained in how to use that dashboard, and you will really understand what each, hopefully, what each thing means. But we still seen from some of the you know, Three Mile Island, some of the accidents with nuclear power stations, when you've got so much information there, it's very easy to get lost in what is going on. Ben very succinctly says, lots of what does not equal why, which I think is really, kind of really quite a key thing. Techniques I like using is I like to think outside in. I think business goals, and I think user journeys. And I even like using things like synthetic transactions, where I'm running core user journeys, testing them in production. Yeah? And I often reuse, kind of, if you're doing BDD, you kind of define up front what you want. You know, if we're an e-commerce store, it would be, uh, can I search for products? Can I look at products? Can I add them to my basket? And can I check out? If I can't do any of those four things, the business is losing money. Yeah. There's probably a whole bunch of other stuff I want, but those are my, say, four key user journeys. Well, I can build out those things using BDD, define them up front, build out my code, and I can run those kind of tests in production. Yeah. I can continually assert, can we you know, search a product? Can we add it to a fake checkout? That kind of thing. And the moment I push in code and I break that synthetic journey, the next time that test gets run in production, it will you know, throw up an error. Go, oh my God, you know, you, you, like one of your core user journeys is affected. Those, like to Ben's sort of why thing, those are almost like the, the kind of, you know, what you should be looking at. The most important things is in what is going on. Why is the customer not able to check out? Why is the customer not able to, um, uh, like, do the kind of business action that you want? Then you need to dive into dashboards and understand what's going on. But from this perspective, I, I'm a big fan of even simple things. Like this is the, um, the I think it's Stash now. It used to be Dashing, Stashing, or Smashing? Smashing framework, I think it's called, based in Ruby. Really simple, kind of you know, nice, um, nice kind of visual thing. You, very easy to load in metrics, very easy to load in lots of interesting things using a REST API. So you just post, effectively, stuff to this, um, this uh, application. And, very quickly, you can see, this is like a made up one, of course, but you can have, say, you know, core transaction values or the amount of transactions going for your platform. All kind of key business information, really obvious, so that everyone from the CEO down to me as a, as a testing person, I can really understand what's the current live snapshot 
are, are, have we committed some code that has had a negative impact on our core you know, KPIs? Once you kind of go one more level, I, I borrow this from uh, Sarah Wells from the FT.com, Financial Times. Sarah's done many interesting talks and keynotes around how the Financial Times have created dashboards and how they've created alerts. And although there's a lot of information there, it's super obvious as to where I need to focus my attention when something is going wrong. Yeah. They really thought about what their kind of core needs are for these things. Yeah. And I definitely encourage you to have a Google for Sarah's stuff. It's, it's really useful. I'm taking my, my other sort of my final tips here from Matt Klein. And, and Matt Klein and the Lyft team have created the Envoy proxy. Um, and they have kind of got this very simple metric system. The, the top one, I believe, is um, actually, I think I've, yeah, I've mixed it up a little bit. So the bottom one, the edge proxy, is kind of top line metrics of an ingress into your system. Are people getting 500s? Is there massive latency being experienced on ingress into my application at a, at a technology level? And if there is, the top graph is all about service to service comms. So you've seen you, the KPI has gone down in our diagram on the left there. Oh, the KPI has gone down. Check my service health. Oh, I've got a couple red, one orange. I'll look, are they communicating correctly to their dependencies? These kind of things. And use, keeping the graphs quite simple. Top line metrics like 500s, um, latency. There's a bunch of interesting tools, um, or interesting methodologies called use, utilization, saturation, and saturation, sorry, and errors, and also um, the red methodology. But then and Google and the SRE book have talked about it a lot. But you really want to keep the graphs simple. Yeah. Think about your values as a business, think about your values as a team, and rather than constantly add new dashboards, constantly add new alerts. Constantly, instead, pair back, keep it minimal, but always think of your top-level goals as an organization. So that was hopefully a bit of a whistle-stop tour through sort of some of the opinionated lessons I've learned. I'm sure you've all got different lessons that sort of your journey in software engineering. But just summarizing some of the key things I did want to say, I do think that defining and sharing your vision across, uh, sorry, vision and goals across all levels of the organization, as cliched as it may sound, is a real game changer. Yeah? When I can understand what I'm doing as an engineer, how that impacts the business, and how maybe I can save money or offer you know, new ideas, this is a real, real you know, competitive advantage. I like to say, ask questions like the Cheshire Cat. If you see your business or you see your team wandering into this fork in the road and they don't really know what they're doing, you know, ask questions before they sort of blindly walk down one path, particularly if it's a kind of type one decision, yeah, which is hard to reverse. That I sort of talked about a bunch of models, you know, only a high level overview, but hopefully you can go away and look more into these models. I found models really good for helping me build an understanding of a very complex world, but critically, uh, really good for helping me communicate with my team on the same level. Yeah? We often you know, talk past each other if we're not careful. I've totally done that in my career. And now I really value being able to make sure I can empathize with my fellow developer, empathize with my fellow tester, empathize with a user, with the business, these things. But I think reducing the friction by using models is really powerful. Optimizing for feedback and learning is really a core skill. And a lot of continuous delivery, I think, leads into this. But do remember, though, lots of what is not equal to why. You really need to think about what your business goals are and then kind of map down through the models and then choose your uh, monitoring, choose your alerting, choose your dashboards based on what you value. That's really key. So on that note, I shall say thank you very much for listening.